Okay, we're back live here inside the Cube in San Francisco for EMC's VSpec launch. And our next guests are Peter Koliopoulos from Arrow, not Arrow Electronics, Arrow E. CS. ACS. And Barbara Spichek from Brocade. Guys, welcome to the Cube. So, this is a, 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 a conversation around um, the channel business, however you want to frame that, relative to um, services, high end services, cloud, mobile, and social. Uh, the world is evolving very fast, well, relatively fast since like 2007. I, mean, I kind of look at the iPhones as the kind of the seminal moment of, of the world we live in, it was that Macintosh moment back in, you know, in the 80s, but the iPhone kind of set the tone for this whole revolution. You go back to the, the iTunes. The cloud was making its way in here. You got cloud computing, mobile, and now social. It's crazy, so the customers are crazy. We heard another uh, panelist say, there's margin and mystery, right? So, yep. you know, margins were great in the early PC days, client <laughs> server, and then margins go down, specialized, specialization happens, polarization in the channel and then fight for services, and now we're in a whole new growth um, market. So I'd like to get your, your take on, Peter, what you guys see as the, as the um, main driver right now for the channel business. Is it customer confusion? Is it just uh, an economic boom that we're hitting? What, are your, what do you see as the core thrust this, or as driving this thermal growth? Well, I, I think that, um, John, I think there's a couple of things. So first of all, you know, the model has typically been um, you know, selling hardware and software right, and sort of being happy with what margins are in the product. And as time has gone on, the squeeze has gone on for margins on both hardware and software. And then there's a run towards services. And services can be rich. If you're reselling, it's not so rich, reselling the services. If you're developing your own services and creating practices and, and then driving that into the customers, it can be very profitable. And I think you'll see that most of the successful channel partners out there have got that blend set up, right? X amount of hardware and software product and Y amount of services. And what they're seeing with cloud, and I think that's the mystery part of it, there's a lot of areas that the customer needs education on, right? Which way should I go? Public, private, hybrid. How does this all fit in? What about my data migration? What about all my data? How do I get it on? How do I get it off? What's the security that I should use? And I think it's in those areas that the, um, the partner base has been able to come up with services that they can offer to the customer to help guide them. Right, to help guide them through the mystery and get them to a place where they say, okay, here's a good way to start, right? and now I can sort of begin to follow up on that. And I think that's going to probably continue for a couple more years. You'll see the move to more services, and then what's going to end up happening is how do we monetize the cloud model right, in terms of um, you know, getting more OPEX revenue, if you will, if you're a partner, as opposed to getting CAPEX revenue. Right? And that's, that's where the model is clearly headed. Um, I think, you know, you can argue... You mean OPEX being more integrated in with the customer? Yeah. From a services yeah. standpoint? Yeah, exactly. From a the old days, run their help desk to now actually run stuff for them. Right. Run backup, run recovery, yeah. disaster recovery, yeah. things right. like that. Either right. on-prem or off-prem, or, you know, providing services around, you know, I'll, I'll sell cloud by the byte or storage by the, you know, infrastructure as a service. You know, getting that service revenue in um, that becomes much more recurring, right? Um, and, and that model is something that's going to happen I think the big question is, okay, so how fast? How yeah. fast does that transition happen? And I think that's you know, an open question. So would you say that over the past few years prior to where we are like now, um, there was an elite core of folks that had a lot of assets, like you guys, who were you know, well capitalized, mm -hmm. a lot of customer you know, install base and, and new services. You had the ability to invest. An elite core that could actually solve some of these higher end problems. But for the most part, to do it's really hard, right? It's, the barriers to entry to come in and say, hey, I'm going to be a cloud uh, broker, or service provider. It was kind of hard. You really kind oh, of yeah. had to have your act together. But now, this announcement today kind of highlights to me that, okay, we got some turnkey things we can actually put in there. Mm -hmm. So kind of, it opens the door up for more guys to come in, more competition for you, maybe, or more partners. I think more partners. And, and I think, again, what it's trying to do, and, and you know, if you look at the continuum, and, and uh, Jeremy talked about it, but if you look at the continuum of component pieces, all the way up to you know, pre-built solutions. You know, this is somewhere in the middle of that continuum. And so it offers the choice in that, well, okay, I don't have those three parts, but I like these three parts. Now I can still be participating. And of course, you'll be able to work with the install base as always on site. So you know, the example I always use is, so what if I'm the guy who bought you know, a piece of equipment yesterday, and today something new comes out, and I can't use what I bought yesterday, right? That's, a, yeah. that's sort of a bad position to put yeah. the customer in. I think this kind of an announcement allows you, no, you don't have to give that up. You can still incorporate it and you can still get leverage from that and still succeed in terms of moving the customer to that maybe first starting place in the cloud. So I think it helps accelerate those people who may have been reluctant for any number of reasons 
to adopt cloud to now yeah. being able to get into It's the a game. trust too. It's like yeah. viability from yep. a market stand, product standpoint, mark, product market fit, if you will, right. and then trust. Having someone that's not going to drop the ball right. and actually follow through. Right. Barbara, what are you seeing? Okay, now the, the vendor equation is interesting, obviously, because you have in the channel business all the big whales in there. You know, in Trank, we had Cisco on earlier, and you know they were pumping their chest up. But you know, Cisco has an entrenched position, and they, they, depending on who you talk to, they're like, you know, you know, love them or hate them. I mean, you know, this this different perspective, but they've always been entrenched. Right? Yep. And so you have a lot of the gear and, or products, hardware products, that have evolved into full-blown solutions that kind of integrate into other areas. Yep. Yeah, there's some partnership here, I have a little VCE here, I got this purpose-built machine here. As a vendor, how do you navigate the, the channel relationships and programs? Yeah. I mean, what are so, your key, th key thoughts there? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. So first of all, I want to comment and expand a little bit on the whole transitioning uh, comment because I think the channel transformation has never been bigger than right now because you mentioned the iPhone, but whether it's uh, records to electronic, books to electronic, I mean, there's been this classic product to customer broken chain, but there's also been a major deconstruction of the IT network, right, with virtualization and cloud and, and uh, the customers needing more like uh, agile, application-aware environments. I think one of the, the solutions you offer is you put those stacks together, right? And one of the key messages to channel partners was the only way to differentiate is, is if you uh, take the complexity out by taking those stacks, right? And put them in front of the customers, which is what you refer to. You know, a lot of what Cisco does, they come in and our competition, you know, puts them into, especially the powerful incumbent vendors can put them together. But uh, what is exciting about this announcement is I think the ability to have this in a more modular, flexible architecture augments that whole desire of channel partners for transformation again, because what they want to do is, they're, they're, I wouldn't even call it, they just want to do services, right? That, that stands for like services, it used to be break, fix, or implementation. Nowadays it means they might even want to do their own hosting, they might do their own, you know, like you said, yeah. backup recovery services, managed services. So. What we do as Brocade, as a vendor, we've been saying the last two years, we help you to stay this point of integration. I think stacks and monolithic architectures usually are not that good for the Well, there's a good lock-in right for now. most people, but I think yeah. that's where I see the, the kind of the vendor gymnastics go on is the lock-in. They yeah. have to use the stack and they use the scare tactics or the pricing or price pressure. You know, but I think, what, what you're, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the channel partners want essentially push-button delivery, right? I mean. Lego yeah. blocks. I don't want to have to spend money to hire yeah. talent. It's cost, but right? I mean, you got you, you know, you want to go into yeah. the cloud business and hire engineers. You're, it's expensive you're and they're hard to right. find. And if I yeah. could hire just basically the equivalent of consultants slash techs that yeah. get it and push buttons and work with customers, and that's a much better solution because it's not one there is more of them. And that's a great key differentiator because um, you're absolutely right, the customers are looking for that, right? They want to outsource that skill set because it's high cost, it's, it's a whole discussion, CapEx versus OpEx. Um, but the big question is where's the point of integration? And that's where <laughs> I don't think the lock-in discussion is only about the cost and so on, it's also from a channel perspective, if they are the point of integration of this solution, which is what VSpecs gives to them, that means they can do that wraparound, if they can do that service to the, to the customer. And what uh, VSpecs does with this whole support layer that, that uh, we've put together, uh, EMC bringing all these ecosystems of vendors together, enables the reseller, even if it's a smaller one, right, if they're servicing the SME space, that usually, you know, have then the same challenge with skill sets and certifications. The whole wrapper we would do around read specs enables them to do exactly that point of integration for a customer. Yeah, I mean, Peter, I want to get your comment on that too, because if you think about it, what I, what I hear from the marketplace is I was just talking to a, a CEO who just took his company public in the past eight months, and, and, and this company's going gangbusters. It's you know, kind of a confidential conversation, but he said, look, at, I can't hire engineers fast enough. We're outsourcing most of our R&D, not because we don't want to outsource R&D, it's because the talent, yeah. to get the talent in, I can't meet my deadlines for go to market. So, you know, the concept of shadow IT was brought up earlier. Again, one of my favorite words um, that gets kicked around is that people just want to get the job done, right? The customers have delivery times, they have SLAs to their business. You guys want to go out and actually sell them products to meet that and you get paid and you add value, you get paid more margin for the more value, right? So with that in mind, what is the key areas for that point? How do you eliminate some of those shadow IT problems that a customer may have? Uh, and and as, as, a, as a solution provider, you're a trusted partner. Mm -hmm. Does this kind of product from EMC kind of help there? And if it does, 
how you compare and contrast it to other vendors? Well, I, I think it does. I think that one of the um, one of the things that we look at is there's a number of ways you can try to eliminate or substitute for the shadow IT. One of it is, and one of the things that we try to bring as a distributor is um, we have people that are certified that we have on staff to be able to do staff augmentation both on the vendor side as well as on the partner side. So anytime you're looking at resource, right, it's always about, um, certainly from a partner standpoint, coverage and capability, right? Can I get the right coverage? Can I get the right capability of someone to do it? And if one or the other is short, which usually it is somewhere, right? I can't put the right person in the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do about that? Do I pass up on the business? Do I partner with another partner? Or can I go back to my distributor who acts as a safety net for me, and they have resource that I can subcontract and put them on site, get it done, and deliver for the customer? I think that's, we certainly do that, and we certainly view that as one of the differentiators for ourselves. I think from the customer standpoint, the idea of push button, um, I think the reason that they want to do push button, and, and you talked about some of that already, is I want to get out of the maintenance of the equipment and the watching it and waiting for updates and trying to make sure that my firmware levels are right. And I want to move on to more value add for my company with IT. Right? And if you look at some numbers on how much money is spent in a current budget on just keeping everything running, yeah. as opposed to me doing something that can help generate revenue, right. it's out of kilter. And I don't think anybody ever imagined it would get into that situation, but as things got more complex and you got you know, sprawl in the IT center, that's what happens. Do you see um, partners, channel partners and integrators, well, we talk talking about solution providers, ISVs, mm -hmm. like being app providers? I mean, like getting into the app business excel on an accelerated basis where they're actually writing apps, actually doing the agile, <laughs> fundamentally integrating that in-house as a function, almost like a, an ad agency would have a creative department? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if, if they're all ready for that. There are some that are starting to go that way, but um, I, I think the model is going to get interesting with cloud. And, and we talked about this, um, you know, when people talk about, well, what about adoption of cloud? How's that all going to happen? Yeah. And one of the differences with adoption of cloud is it actually started on the consumer side, much more so than on the B2B side, which is something that's never happened before where the consumer actually adopts first. So it's not going yeah. away anytime soon. The question is, is, um, and I think it's a, it's a real question that you know, I don't profess to have the answer to, but all right, so the way we build applications today, is that the way we're going to build them in, in the cloud? Yeah, yeah. Or do you end up having things like an enterprise app store? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Right? Yeah. That, that yeah. kind of divides it up and you sort and of And again, this is, this is the whole problem of SOA architectures, whether it's going to be cataloged. So right. I, I mean, I think ultimately, my, I agree. I think my view is, and this is kind of what my prediction is, is that, to get to win the channel business, you got to have like at HP, we have the old the old Bible catalog of all the parts. Mm. You got to have a, a part list, and those part yeah. lists are now prefabricated infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, you want some private cloud to support you know yeah. low latency, ten zillion users, multi tenancy <laughs> product. If I if I can add to that, I think that same catalog and modular architecture goes to services mm. because we you were, you were talking about do we have partners that write apps now, do we actually have partners that do hosting, you know, do we have really managed services? I mean these are all big words, but this is all what I call the cloud identity disorder, right? They're all trying to find their place, including distribution, mm -hmm. right? You guys are do we do cloud aggregation, do we add our own services? Some yeah. of them are adding huge service organizations like yourselves. But uh, I think the modularity is key because you will you note know, this classic, we used to have the VARs and the SIs and these, these nomenclatures I think are gonna explode over the next couple of years. And I hear partners talking about it now, are they there, right? But I think as a vendor, the more you can do in terms of modular offerings, helping them on their way, you know, the more successful you can be. Because yeah, that's what they're all We tried to vet that out on another interview, but what's the layout of the, of the current channel, if you want to call it an ecosystem, you know, we heard solution providers yeah. and then subcategories, the old classic mm -hmm. ISVs. Um, well, I got only a couple of minutes left, so I want to kind of ask some different questions, which is um, going forward, obviously the channel's used to having some support and the partnerships are critical. EMC's talking here about their brand is, their, is the flagship into the accounts, that's their logo, you guys can draft under it and provide services. What's, what's going to be different, Pete and Barbara, in your mind, going forward over the next five to 10 years with the, with the channel? Is obviously supporting margin and getting out business opportunities, joint selling, uh, no channel conflict, you know, the normal table yep. stakes. Beyond the table stakes, what do you see that's new? What, that could be a new offering, Pete, that, that you say, you know, I see this could be a new <laughs> level of equivalent of a co-op or MDF like fun. Um, interesting, so one of the things that we began offering um, you know, to our partners, and we'll continue to build it out, is um, if you look at the value chain and you look at where distribution sits, okay, just 
think where they are, okay? There's only a couple of people who have the whole picture of what's being sold to a particular customer, right? And we're one of those people. So what if I'm able to monetize that data using things like advanced analytics? You're the big data business. Right? Yeah. And I'm in the big data business, and I got big data, I got a lot of it. Customer data, right. trend Customer data. Customer data, yeah. trending data, and that's what we've actually released in our advanced an analytics. You're the Splunk of the channel. Yeah. You know, you can, <laughs> I don't think I'd quite go that you know. far yet, but, <laughs> but certainly if you talk about you know, a value that you can bring, yeah, yeah. as I like to talk to our salespeople about it, and they always you know, get a chuckle out, I said, let me make this really simple. How about if I can find you better leads faster? Yes. Right? To me, that's a huge win for the partners, and I'm using data that I already have, that I'm able to leverage, and I'm able to point them in the right direction on what's the probability if you buy A, you're going to buy B. I think that's a huge thing that actually um, the, the partner, and, and I would ask Barbara, I'll bet every one of your partners complains about, you know, when we all say we're doing demand generation, right, they go, yeah, well, the leads I get, yeah, you know, they're sort of yeah. okay, right, we all sort of suffer through that. What about if you can make that, I'll give you less leads, but I got a better hit rate. Yep. Right, huge win. I'd love to for the part. have you hook up with Alice Williams, one of our uh, senior editor writers and editors, about that story. I think because we are obviously big data is on one of our wheelhouses that we'd love to program mm -hmm. in. Yep. I think that's a real successor, and one of the things we're, uh, we're theming up this year is how people are using big data. So we looked at having a category of big data, like a publication, but no, we see data as an as a fundamental disruptive enabler, like TCP/IP did back in the old networking days, like uh, the computing cycle on the PC. So. It's not a category, it's every category. So that's a great example of differentiation and competitive yep. advantage. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, using the data that you got as a lever for predictive analytics, uh, obviously at the end of the day it's about sales, right? right. So, you know, you've got to drive business, um, market exactly. research, how to serve your customers. Mm -hmm. So that would be really something I'd love to see you should do. And, and I think that's a real cutting edge case study. We'd love to do a little, little side report on that. Um, okay, well guys, thanks for, for uh, joining us Thank on theCUBE. Big Sean. data is again rearing its head here as an advantage. Again, big data is big. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with, with more information and interviews right after this.